In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom, dear friend. This is wonderful to be with you today. My name is Natalie Blackham, and this is In the Last Days TV program. And again, we are doing news and interviews from the land of Israel. And today we have Dave Mason. This is wonderful. He wrote a book, The Lamp of Darkness. So we are going to speak about that and why he wrote it and all this kind of thing and a bit of his background. So Dave, thank you for coming today. This is wonderful to have you. And today is a special day because it's Yom HaShoah, which is the day to remember uh, the six million Jews who died uh, during the Holocaust. And we know how important it is to speak about it, to speak to our children about it, and to speak to our grandchildren about it. So carry on this tradition because it's so important. And the Jews brought us the Bible, and it's what we have in common with the Jewish people and want to carry on growing and knowing the Bible, and this book is great about that. So Dave, give us a bit of background, where you come from, and how you arrive in Israel, and it would be wonderful for us to know. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So my background, I was born in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and I grew up a Reformed Jew. So I felt very, very strongly culturally Jewish. My Jewish identity was deeply ingrained in me, we were not terribly religious. We didn't keep kosher. We didn't keep Shabbat. Um, I did go to Hebrew school and learned a bit about Jewish background, but really just scratched the surface. We was never expected to really read the Bible or any of the Jewish oral traditions. We, again, was much more concerned about the holidays and the different aspects of culturally being Jewish. And my journey really took a step up when I, when I got to college because I didn't really think anything of my Jewish background. Everybody around me was Jewish. Most of my friends were Jewish. My community was mostly Jewish. And when I got to college in Colorado, there were very, very few Jews. And I found that there was a way that I connected with the other Jews on campus that I didn't wind up connecting with the other non-Jews in ways I couldn't really explain. There was a similar sense of humor a similar cultural understanding. And most of my friends were not Jewish, but there was one small organized Jewish group. And the first time I went there, I felt like I'd known these people for life, that we just shared an unspoken language that I, I didn't have with all the, all the other friends I had on campus. And I, because of that, I wound up becoming very involved in a very tiny Jewish community on campus and coming and spending my, a semester of my final year of college in Israel. And that was the first time that I got exposed to a wider Jewish world. The, the Orthodox world before then always seemed something very strange and very different from what, what I'd experienced. And as I tell you that I grew up with mostly a cultural Jewish experience, that wasn't my thought at the time. I'd been to Hebrew school. I thought I knew a lot about Judaism. And yet when I got to Israel and I first started speaking to, to Orthodox Jews and first stepped into a yeshiva, one of the places where they so talk yeshiva, about... Yeshiva, yeshiva. Yeshiva is a, you know, an institution of study mm -hmm. of, the, of the Jewish texts. And they were talking about things as being among the most basic concepts in Judaism. And even though I'd had 10 years of education, you know, once a week, up to three times a week, and thought of myself as educated because that was a lot in the community I grew up in, I realized I'd never heard of the things they were talking about. And I felt almost kind of cheated of my Jewish education. Mm -hmm. And I decided not from a place of strong religious desire, but from a place of wanting to understand my background more to start studying and start learning. And I realized that there was just a wealth of knowledge and that I'd never been exposed to before. And I got fascinated by it and started learning more and more. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, I, I think most of the things I thought about God and religion were probably coming from more of a Christian place than a Jewish place because I grew up in America mm -hmm. and it's a dominantly Christian culture and when people are talking about God it's more coming from the Christian approach than, than the Jewish approach and I never really questioned whether there could be a difference 
And so the longer I studied, the more, the more I knew. And truthfully, I did not become an Orthodox Jew then and there. Um, I was mostly engaged in the study. And, but I was not feeling a strong desire to be practicing. I just wanted to be learning. And that changed when I went back to America, interestingly enough. Because in Israel, I was surrounded by people who were studying Judaism and talking about Judaism. And I was just in that world so much. I didn't have to make a commitment to feel connected to it. And yet when I went back to America, I went to law school. And then I wound up becoming an environmental attorney in the States. And while I was in America, and feel, I felt very detached. So this was, this was in one year, all these things that you discovered. So I was total in yeshiva for about 15 months. And then I decided to go back because I was feeling a bit awkward. I was loving the study, but I, had not, I was in an environment where everybody at my level of study was orthodox, and I was not. And that difference felt strange to me. I hadn't really made any life choices. And I went back to America, and I went to law school. And suddenly, when I was no longer surrounded by this environment of study, I started feeling a stronger desire to increase my level of practice and increase my level of connection. Mm -hmm. It was suddenly time to be making decisions. And within really just a few weeks of getting back to America, I decided that, yes, I want to start eating only kosher food, which I'd been doing exclusively while I was in Israel, but never with the conscious choice that I wanted to make this, it's not this decision for life. It's not difficult to do that here. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing with keeping Shabbat, keeping the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I'd been doing it when I was in Israel, but not from a decision that, yes, this is what I'm going to be doing, but because that's the environment I was living in. And so very quickly, I decided to take steps towards becoming more orthodox. And that process continued over the bit by bit over the five year period that I was back in America. Mm -hmm. When you say orthodox, it makes me smile in one way, because yeah. it's not the orthodox like the old way in one way, like people think boring, too much of the Torah, or, but it's, no, it's true. I think a lot of people are like that. But when you see, and I can see here in Israel, there is a new type of orthodox, I would say. And, and it's like, because you love the Torah and because you want to follow it and love the story. Do you understand what, what I mean? Because some people are a bit, they, they can see the orthodox, like the black hat and all these uh, things. And, one other way is maybe connected. I don't know. There is something. Sometimes they are maybe not connected to life, but they are. But do you understand what I mean? I do. It's like it's a new way. I can see a new type of young Israeli who didn't have a big religious background, but suddenly discovered the Torah and the love of Torah and the love of knowing God and and like connecting with the land. It's it's a whole universe. It's a revival, I would say, of, of souls who wants to be more connected to God and, and to his Torah. What do you think? There's no question that the community I'm connected to here is very, very fired up, mm -hmm. is very into, it's not all about, oh, we're supposed to do this, we're supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. It's much more about... When we do when this and when we do that, we are connected with him. Connecting with God, yes, mm -hmm. but also how a person can really reach their potential in this world. What everything has to do with, it's very much focused on personal growth mm -hmm. and understanding that the Torah and all of these rules and all of this tradition is written down in order to help us grow yeah. and help us understand. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you wanted the Jews to just keep the law, mm -hmm. the Torah, the whole Bible could have been written as a, as a code of laws, mm -hmm. but it's mostly not. It's mostly written as stories. And it's not written, the stories are not recorded because they're true and they happened and therefore it's important to remember them. Many, many true things happened back in that time period that were not recorded, that were not written down. But these particular stories were preserved. Why? Because they actually show the path that, these, that our ancestors were walking and show the decisions and the struggles that they were having. And we're able to read them and we're able to learn from them and we'll be able to be inspired by them. And each story is just packed with so many levels of meaning. Mm -hmm. we, uh, one of the, the teachers at the yeshiva pointed out to me that you'd never, you'd never have in mathematics mm -hmm. a fifth grader and a PhD person reading the same book of mathematics. They'd be completely at different levels 
and the fifth grader is going to read you know, the elementary school book, which is going to lay everything out in very basic terms, and the PhD is going to be working on you know, dissertation type, type materials and looking at very high end mathematics that the fifth grader would be completely boggled by. The difference with the Torah is that we're all looking at one text, but we say there are 70 levels of meaning into, imbued in the one text. And everybody's able to look at the same text. And get what he needs for his level. Yeah, exactly. It's wonderful. This is good. You see, it's what we want to give you. is like the Bible, the Torah, the writing are so packed. I mean, it's like I'm in love with the Torah. And I'm in love with to see what's happening in Israel and how the light can come from this nation and is coming from this nation. So speak a bit more also about what, so you've done all these things, you came here, but now there is a fruit who came from all these studies and it's a book. Can you speak to us about, about the book a bit? Absolutely, so um, first let me jump ahead a bit in the story. So mm -hmm. after five years in, in America, mm -hmm. um, I decided to come back to Israel, not to move back here, just to, to come back. I got a one-way ticket. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And even though I'd spent several years of my life in Israel up to that point, when I got back within 24 hours, I knew that I was home and I was never going to leave. Mm -hmm. And it was a very different flavor than it had been in the past. In the past, it had always been a bit of a struggle. There were things I liked and there were things I didn't like. And I got back, and it's 11 years ago now, and those things I didn't like didn't really raise their raised their heads this time, and it was, it's, I just felt so at home. And I think the transformations I'd gone through during those five years as I was suddenly growing in my own practice really changed the way I interacted with Israel. And So this was when? This was in 2003. Okay. And at the time, so I, I transitioned from working in the law, which I did in America doing environmental law work, and then when I came to Israel, I really wanted to have a much more balanced life. And I saw... I loved the type of work I was doing in the States, but I saw that the attorneys worked themselves incredibly hard and that work had to be you know, their, their, primary, their primary focus. And I, I wanted to build a family and I wanted to study Torah and I wanted to find a way of blending everything in together. So I've been able to, I was very fortunate to be able to split my days. I have a, a US-based business that I'm able to run in the evenings that, uh, and I'm able to spend my mornings again studying in yeshiva and several years into the study, I had a flash. And it actually came from a place of reading the stories of the early prophets and taking a class into the inner workings of prophecy, which was something that up until then, even though I'd had almost a decade of Torah study up to that point, I'd never really dug into. It was not one of the areas that was so commonly studied. And I loved it. I loved the stories of the prophets. And so when you speak the, uh, the prophets, which, which one? So I'm, this section was really starting with the book of Joshua. Mm -hmm. I was going through the book of Kings. Mm -hmm. and, but the part that I loved more than any was the, the stories of, of Elijah, Eliyahu, as we, as we call him in Hebrew. And part of what I loved about the stories of, of Elijah is that they were not black and white. We have this, this whole concept of the dark, evil king facing off against the, the righteous, holy prophet. And to a certain extent, the, the story of Ahab and Elijah fits that. But if you really dig into the story, there's also, there are hints that this evil king really wanted the, the welfare of his people. And the, the Jewish oral tradition talks about all the kindness that people used to do to each other in the, in the age of that king. And I really see that this king is somebody who really genuinely wants the people to get along, for peace to really reign. And he is stuck between two complete fanatics. His wife, Izebel, who wants to kill all of the prophets, destroy any connections to God in the land, and have the people worship her gods of Baal and Asherah, and on the other hand, Elijah, this prophet of God, who is also a complete fanatic, who believes that we should completely destroy all idolatry from the land and return everyone to the service of God. And both Izebel and Elijah, sorry, this should say in English for your readers, so Jezebel, I think it's how it's pronounced in English, Jezebel and Elijah are both willing to be harsh 
in order to get their, to get their ends. And Ahab is stuck in the middle because he, he worships God and he worships the idols. And he doesn't want harshness. He wants everyone to get along with each other. Which is interesting because you're right. And I've learned a bit of the Jewish way of thinking. And it's like sometimes it's better to take the middle road than the extreme for the good, for the good of the people. This is the thing. So it's very, I read what you were saying and it's so true. And, and I think it's very important because sometimes as Christian, we've learned what is black and what is, what is uh, white. Mm -hmm. I come from a background, France, humanism and all of that. So when I discovered the Bible, that there was a way of, of going, I was like, great, now I know where I go. And but now learning about all the Jewish way, and, and it is, but it's like God has a, is so great and so wise that sometimes you have to do a certain things, not f just for you, but for the good of everybody. So we have in one way was this kind of, of wicked God, uh, sorry, wicked king, but wanted to, good, to do the good for the, for the people. Exactly, and as opposed to Abraham, who mm -hmm. argued with God on behalf of the wicked and argued with God to be merciful to, to the wicked. Elijah was arguing with God to be more harsh in order to, to turn the people away from these idols and towards the, the worship of God. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that Elijah brings upon a, a drought upon the land mm -hmm. and is able to bring tremendous suffering to the people. And God allows that to happen. Yet you see, and we're going to get into this more in books two and three, that God allows it to happen, but at the same time is trying to shift Elijah's perspective mm -hmm. to be more merciful and say that we can't exist only from a place of strict judgment. In fact, there's a, there's a story from the, oral, the Jewish oral tradition mm -hmm. that if you look in the first chapter of the Bible, that there are, there are different names of God that are given throughout the Bible. And in the first chapter, one of them is used. The word, um, what we'd say, Elohim mm -hmm. in, the, in Hebrew, mm -hmm. that is a name of God that represents the attribute of justice. Mm -hmm. And in the second chapter, a second name of God is introduced that represents the, the attribute of mercy. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a tradition that says, that first God created the world just from a place of justice, mm -hmm. but that God looked at the world and said, if justice only rules, the world is going to destroy itself. Mm -hmm. And so mercy was introduced right after the creation. This is so basic Jewish way of thinking, but exactly. so, so important. You see, again, I want to connect. We lived here for five years, and even before we were starting to try to understand, like we are Christian, but we need we have Jewish roots, and we need to understand where we come from. And this is so so important because suddenly, you know that in your life you need to be kind, and not just like this is right, this is wrong, and it doesn't work. I mean, like with the child. How you, you, you can't say this is right and this is wrong. First of all, you have to be kind with the child for him right. to be able to, to learn. So. Exactly, and, and Elijah then comes back and very much argues for this perspective of justice. Mm -hmm. And this is the debate between not whether Elijah is right to want to turn the people away from idolatry and towards God, mm -hmm. but whether the place of justice and the place of mercy in the world and how those two need to balance each other out. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a point that has come up a lot recently in discussion with, with Christians. Um, the difference between reading the Bible in its original Hebrew mm -hmm. and reading it in the, the translation for things like that about the different names of God and this one which you know, indicates justice and this one which indicates mm -hmm. mercy. And, you don't you know, see it you're, in you're, you're gonna You're going to completely miss it if uh, you're uh, reading. Uh, you know, the uh, English was mostly translated from maybe from the Latin which is translated from the Greek which is translated mm -hmm. from the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Layers of meaning. Oh, we don't, you don't see it. You can, it's God. Right. But it's not even now more you know about God. This name is not his name, funny enough. It's not. It's like right. Elohim and Hashem, which is like the God of, of mercy. Exactly. So it's very interesting. Now, we want to 
like you, you might be very hungry and say, what is this book? So it's called The Lamp of Darkness. And it's the first book of Dave was telling me five books coming. And uh, tell us the story, how you bring all this. You've done a lot of research. You've done yes. six years of research to know. So that, tell us, maybe tell us about the, the main character in, in, the, in the book. OK, so as I mentioned, the, the story, my favorite story of the entire Bible is the story of Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel. And I wanted to be unpacking that story and also unpacking the times that the pe they were living in. Um, one of the things that you'll find in the Bible and in all of the, the texts that were written subsequently is that their world is radically different from our world. And if somebody was writing a book now on the biblical times, they'd have to familiarize people with what the land looks like, with the way people dressed, with the way people ate. And yet, at the time that the Bible itself was written, all those things were known. And so it's not important for the Bible itself to go into the details of what life was like to create that kind of context. And that was one of my big goals in the book, was to make the, Bible, the biblical stories come alive by really planting the reader into that time and into that, into that lifestyle. And and you've done very well. Thank because you. we are in it. <laughs> you just jump in the book and you are in the universe of, of the book. So it's great. That's, that's certainly what, I, what I've attempted mm -hmm. to do. And to really make that time period come alive and to really emphasize what, what idolatry in that time frame was about. What, what the connection to God in that time frame what was about, because it's radically different than it was today. In fact, you talked before about the, you know, the Orthodox Jews and the way they live their, their life. Most of the laws we follow are created a thousand years later, as during Roman times, during the time of exile. Mm -hmm. Much of Jewish law was created in order to get us through this period of exile, mm -hmm. because so much of the, our connection was connection to the land, connection to the temple, and connection through having a, a nation. And so it was perfectly okay to have one person, to have the high priest going into the, the most holy place in the, in the world, into the, the Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies in the temple, once a year in Yom Kippur, in order to be doing the service for the entire nation. Because the entire nation was connected. Mm -hmm. And all of the men were supposed to go to the temple three times a year. And so you had the priest class, and you had these different classes of people. But then suddenly to have a community of 12 families in living in Poland 2,500 years later, you needed a different way of embodying the Jewish tradition so that it wouldn't be completely lost because you had no connection to the land. You had no connection to a temple or to the priestly class or to the, even though there were some remnants of that in, in Poland. But it was no longer a national experience. It had to be the experience had to live on in the individuals mm -hmm. and in the communities. Mm -hmm. and so and I think people start to realize these things, like the Jewish people here start to realize that now this is their land. Now they can live again, like their freedom. Because when you are in exile, you had to keep something and like preserve it so strongly that you have to have almost extra rules to keep all of that. And now it's like, this is my land. I don't need all these things. I mean, obviously, you keep the, the Torah, but it's like there is a freedom. And, and we, we spoke with some also other Orthodox people who are discovering that they don't need to be anymore with the exile mentality. It's like, that's it. We are back here. and We are living in a new era. Exactly. And, and even somebody who's completely secular, who co co keeps almost none of the commandments of the Torah, as my wife likes to point out, you go to Tel Aviv. And you go on a Friday night when it's, when it's Shabbat, when it's the Sabbath, into a nightclub. You have two totally secular Israelis who are going to see each other. What are they going to say to each other? They're going to say, Shabbat Shalom, mm -hmm. good, uh, you know, a, a, good, a good Sabbath. It's so much in the consciousness mm -hmm. of living here and of being in, the, in this world that even if you don't try to, to connect to it, we just came out of Passover. And you go into any supermarket and all of the bread is going to be covered, everything that is made with, made with bread that is not kosher for Passover is going to be covered up and you're not going to be able to buy it anywhere in the entire country because it, it's so much more of a connection. And so I wanted to really build that world. But what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to mess 
too much with the biblical characters. Mm -hmm. Elijah this has... is very good because so many times, I mean, we see that there is a film Noah and there is yes. different film and it's like, okay, we know we, you didn't know all of that, but one day we need to see all this, that the real film with the real background because people are hungry for that. And uh, you know, we're getting like very short of time, but this is, we, we really, you know, you will enjoy this book, The Lamp of Darkness. You can find it, we'll write it. You know, everything is written uh, on the screen and you will enjoy is the Bible becoming alive again. And for uh, young people, for grown-ups, something that you can, you, you can be with the prophets, you can be in the land of Israel, you can learn Jewish um, words also, you can learn, uh, you, you can understand the, the tradition and it's a great way to be introduced to more of the Hebrew uh, Hebraic way of thinking. Uh, Dave, we, we wish you the best. We are waiting for the second book. And go on Amazon, guys. You can see all the people, what they are saying about the book. And it's, it's really a great book to connect with the land of Israel, with her people. I wish you the best. And uh, we are waiting for the books. And I'm sure that one day we can see also a film of this of these books. It will be wonderful. I, I certainly hope so. And my goal now is really just to get the book out there. So I've made it a free download on Amazon, free download on Barnes & Noble. So I, I hope people go and, and check it out. And um, my email is, is in there at the end. And I, I love to hear from, hear from readers and hear people's feedback and, and engage in that. Because so much of what we're trying to do is to create dialogue and to create connections and to make this story come to life. And the story comes from Zion, <laughs> written in Zion. So friends, Dev, thank you for coming today. This is wonderful. And friends, we send you blessing from Zion. And don't forget, we are living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter. Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.